very small scale. Indie developers that produce quality titles that people want to buy, for example, Minecraft is one that springs instantly to mind. It's a very lucrative uh, industry now, and if you provide a quality product, you'll get the customers coming, and uh, everybody's a winner. The end user gets a cheap, a, a cheap product, and um, that's of high quality, and the developer makes uh, a substantial sum of money in the process, and everybody wins. And you do wonder whether this is going to be a, a newer business model in the future, because traditionally, I think, the indie developer was always looked upon as maybe the, the small person in the bedroom who maybe made a few pounds for a title that a couple of people likes. Now you've got titles like Minecraft, which are bought in games and making the, you know, these developers that have probably have very little resources, um, making them a lot of money. So I, it's a very good thing. The innovation in these titles, I said on my review on the site, these days when you have a PlayStation 3 or an Xbox or a Wii, most of the titles that come out today seem to be first-person shooters. And in a year's time, if I was to ask you, oh, what was that first-person shooter like that you played last year, you probably wouldn't remember what it was like because there was nothing unique about it. It had its own graphics, it had its own sound effects, but apart from that, it was just very much the same as every other first-person shooter that you've ever played. Whereas what we're seeing in the indie scene is a lot of innovation, a lot of creativity, um, and games are actually fun to play, not necessarily ones that just bamboozle you with cutscenes and fancy graphics in order to hide a more thin uh, gameplay. And these games are relying on a decent gameplay because they haven't got the, a team of 15, 20 graphics artists who are completely dedicated to providing the, the GFX for that particular title. So I think it's a good thing. Um, and we're seeing a, a diverse range of different games. Uh, I think recently we talked about Pioneer, which was a remake of the Elite Frontier game. Again, that's coming on leaps and downs. That's going to be covered very shortly when they release next version and that is really impressing a lot of people um, by the amount of time put into it so I've got quite a few titles coming up unfortunately I just don't have enough time to, to look at them all but uh, there's, there's some very exciting things happening in the world of Linux gaming in particular so uh, certainly we'll try and cover as much of it as we can yeah, You mentioned the uh, first person shooters um, <clears throat> so you have these branches uh, well there is the types of games you can classify them into based on the way that the game is organized. Something would be a tournament between uh, between different people, possibly with network gaming, uh, and some of them would be uh, missions and completion of levels. And then within that you have the sort of the cultures or the themes uh, based around things like aliens, it can be things like um, uh, soldiers, it can be things like retro, or you have things like swords, and and basically the engine stays the same, so it's very economically efficient to make more and more of these games, you just create new polygons and meshes of polygons and stuff, which you could hire a developer to do, or even to reuse things, and just change a few polygons here and there, to like, you know, turn something into a helmet, or change the gun into something that looks more like a futuristic laser gun or something. So it's not too hard to do that once you've got all the pieces in place. If anything, it shows you quite a bit the merits of uh, of working with free software, even though I think also the proprietary side uses a great deal of uh, so-called licensing of code and reuse of code and uh, game engines too. So but they use the more expensive ones, the ones that have a bit more uh, investments going into them. So just as you mentioned, building your own distro, you might as well build your own uh, Watt file or your own kind of world that's for the use by people who are playing a uh, uh, shooting game of some sort. Well, I don't know if you've got any other releases you wanted to mention. Um... Well, one thing I was I was going to very briefly mention is the release of KDE uh, 4.7. I think it's a very important release because of myself, I'm a KDE user, but almost nobody is going to use KDE 4.7 anytime very soon because they wait for a distro to include that uh, out of the box. And I believe one of the first to do so uh, will come out in October and it'll be Ubuntu. Uh, then there will be Fedora and a few more, but I think Fedora also has 4.7 built for it already. So uh, that's probably not as well tested as actually using what comes with the distro. I find from experience if your distro comes with KDE version something or GNOME version something that you're trying to upgrade in place and move into a version that's a bit 
uh, more recent uh, need not guarantee that things will work the way you expect it to because the developers haven't had time to test uh, the integration of applications in the desktop environment for versions which at the time hadn't been released yet. Um, so that's just uh, uh, a bit of a common rule, but that, that's the thing. Anyway, KD, you know, new versions out. Next one is going to be better. I suppose Torvalds is not going to use it because he's moving to XFCE. And he has some harsh words again for Gnome, if you recall correctly, or if you recall it at all in, in general. Uh, Linus was getting in a bit of a fire, uh, flame war of sorts. He was coming on the fire for. Uh, criticizing the GNOME community and actually called them something like interface Nazis, I think, at the time, which thought him to actually have to give a patch to sort of get some forgiven from them. But yeah, he's, he's a bit outspoken at times, and I think he's also quote mind, just as many people are um, considered to be influential in the Linux community in the way to try to demean and to do demote to uh, berate the Linux communities to try to take some of those called so-called uh, spiritual leaders and and try to assign things to them that then will kind of extrapolate into the whole user base. And we see loads of that with not just with Torvalds, but we see it with certain companies with C. Actually in recent years I just find lots of people try to characterize uh, Mark Shuttleworth as being very greedy and uh, selfish and whatever, and almost nobody says the same things about the executives of the companies that are actually proprietary software companies. But again, it's very easy to criticize Ubuntu, and then you, if you want to criticize Ubuntu, who's better to criticize than the person who's heading the project or the founder of the Ubuntu project? Well, we've, um, I think, there's nothing else that I particularly want to cover in the release. I'll we obviously, I think uh, it goes without saying when we get ourselves organised and for the next episode, it's going to be more of a, a, a structured uh, episode. But literally, Roy's just got back from being away with work, and I've been left to my own devices for the last week or so. So, of course, uh, I've created no, no amount of mayhem uh, all around the web. So, um, probably next episode is going to be more structured, and uh, we'll certainly have a have a better list of things to cover. And um, is there anything else you want to look at, Roy, before we close off for the well, day? Well, I have uh, before me right now five links, uh, both associated with sub notebooks, uh, another way, another name basically for netbooks, uh, but mostly with uh, with tablets now. It seems that Linux is doing exceptionally well on these if you consider Linux to be, uh, well, if you consider it to be, to Android to be an embodiment of some sort of Linux as a whole. Uh, there is this ongoing debate about how open Android is among the uh, proprietary or open platforms uh, based on Linux, because of course, based on Linux you have a variety of platforms, uh, both proprietary and so-called open, so WebOS is a closed one, uh, Android is considered the uh, so-called open one, and I've always been a bit critical about it, because I just think that Android is a representation on the one hand on the use of Linux in many devices because of the cost and uh, because of the power as well but on the other hand it's also the uh, put into use the principles formerly known as Palladium uh, or you know TPM trusted computing you know company controls what you install in your system and can delete applications from your system without your uh, consent uh, and none of this is what we increasingly see when it comes to those devices uh, driven by those platforms that are supposed to make things easier. And one of the ways to make things easier is putting control in a centralized place instead of just allowing people to install things themselves and decide for themselves what's good for them. Um, so I see lots of tablets now running Android. I'm seeing a, actually we're seeing some statistics about the sales of Android outpacing by far uh, even Apple sales and Microsoft standing at somewhere very decent at around 1% and maybe one day Microsoft too will you know, manage to escape the 1% and you know there will be the year of Windows on the uh, I don't know the phones or something <laughs> so we can kind of tease the uh, Windows trolls about it um, and yes and, and basically 
it seems to me, in general, I feel very much relaxed in the same way that Rocklaw did, because I think Linux is one. Uh, if you define the goal to be basically Linux in every device, uh, and Linux in the mainstream is a platform which people feel